Hello everyone, in today's video we are going to look at Clausius's theorem. Now, Clausius' theorem is a really important theorem in thermodynamics, thermal physics, and it is also what led Clausius to first define the notion and the concept of entropy. So in this video we're going to look at Clausius' theorem, in the next video we're going to get on to the original definition of entropy and see what that is, and also see how entropy relates to the second law of thermodynamics. Now, Clausius was inspired for this theorem by the work of Sadi Carnot, and Sadi Carnot, we discovered in the last video, came up with this concept of a Carnot engine. Now, a Carnot engine is the theoretical engine that is the most efficient type of engine possible. Any other engine which is more efficient than this actually violates the second law of thermodynamics. And the way a Carnot engine is structured is as follows. So here we have a big uh, reservoir, which is at a constant high temperature, TH. And this reservoir ejects heat, labelled QH, into the engine. And the reservoir is so vast, it's so big, that when it ejects this heat, QH, into the engine, the temperature up here doesn't change. So it always stays at this high temperature, TH. So the Carnot engine ejects heat, sorry, the, the reservoir ejects heat into the Carnot engine, the Carnot engine then outputs some form of work, some form of mechanical work, and it also ejects some heat, QL, into another reservoir which is at a colder temperature, labelled TL. So you can think of this like a steam train, as we discussed, where you have the hot furnace, that's this reservoir, that ejects heat um, via steam into the engine. The engine then does some work in that it propels the train forward, and then a big plume of steam comes out the top of the engine, and that is this heat being ejected into the colder reservoir that is the atmosphere. Now, another point to make about Carnot engines, which will become important, is that they are the only type of engines that are entirely reversible. And what does reversible mean? Well, all it means is that we can reverse the direction of all of these arrows. So instead of ejecting heat into the engine, and then using that for the engine to output work, we can actually put work into the engine, and then the engine will draw heat from the colder reservoir and eject it into the warmer reservoir. And an example of that is your freezer, because your freezer sucks heat out of a cold box and ejects it into the warmer room. And in order to do that, we need to put work in. We need to put work in in the form of electrical energy. So, a Carnot engine can be run either way. It can be run in reverse, where we put work in, or it can be run uh, normally, where we take work out. And the other thing, the last thing to note about Carnot engines, is that they're cyclical. So, what that means is, if first we put a load of heat into the engine, and then we get work out, and it ejects heat out, by the time all that is done, the engine is in exactly the same state that it was when we started, and we can run the process all over again. We can put more heat in, we can get more work out, and more heat out. So they're cyclical and they're reversible. And one result of all of this with Carnot engines, which I won't prove here, but if you would like to see a proof for it, feel free to leave a comment down below and we can do a video on that, is that the ratio of heat which we put in to which we get out which is QH over QL, we put in QH, we get QL out, that is equal to the ratio of the temperature of the hot reservoir to the temperature of the cold reservoir. And like I said, there is a proof for this, but I'm not going to prove it here, but hopefully you can see, if it's not obvious that this is the case, that it's at least plausible it's the case, right? So the, the hotter we keep this reservoir relative to this one, the greater the heat we can put in relative to the heat we get out. Um, and I think that's fairly intuitive that that's at least plausible, if not obvious. So, the first step in Clausius's theorem is Clausius thought, let's calculate the following. Let's calculate the sum, which is written here as the symbol sigma, over the course of one cycle of this quantity, of heat at each stage versus, sorry, um, over the temperature at each stage. So, in, um, in a Carnot engine, what this is equal to is, well, first we put in heat at QH from a temperature TH, so this is equal to QH over TH, and then we get out heat QL at temperature TL, so because we're getting it out, we're taking it out of the system, we have to do a minus QL 
over TL. But what we notice is that if we were to rearrange this up here, then we see that QH over TH is equal to QL over TL. So these two factors are the same, and this is actually equal to zero. So the first step in Clausius' theorem is that for a reversible Carnot engine, which is actually the only type of engine that is perfectly reversible, then as we go through the whole cycle, this quantity here, which is the ratio of the heat over temperature, either which we get in or take out, over the course of an entire cycle of the engine is equal to zero. Now that is the first step in, um, in Clausius's theorem. But one thing you might want to say at this stage is that it's all very well doing this for a theoretical engine, the theoretically most perfectly efficient engine that there is. But we want to generalize this. We want to make it so that it applies to every type of engine, not just engines that are perfectly, um, that are maximally efficient and not just engines that are reversible and not just engines also where the temperature of the reservoirs are fixed. Because in the real world, that never really happens, right? In the real world, when we've got our furnace in our steam train, as heat is ejected from the furnace into the engine, the temperature of the furnace drops. That's why we have to keep shoveling coal in. So this is all very well and good for a hypothetical engine that we can never really achieve in real life. But what we need to do is generalize this to deal with engines that are not perfectly efficient. So let's do that. Right, so now I would like to draw your attention to this diagram over here. Now, this diagram, this circle here, this represents a, um, an engine and the cycle of an engine. So if we start here, by the time we go around this entire cycle and end up at the same point, the engine is in exactly the same state which it started at. Um, and this engine, over the course of one entire cycle, outputs some amount of work, which I've written as delta W. So over the course of one cycle, it outputs delta W in work. Um, and just looking at this little part of the cycle here, where I put the arrow, over this little part of the cycle, we have heat DQI being put into the engine. And that heat is coming from this reservoir. And at the point at which it's injecting the heat, the reservoir is at temperature TI. So it's important to say that unlike a Carnot engine, where this reservoir is at fixed temperature, over here, this reservoir is no longer at fixed temperature. This TI can change. Um, so what we want to know is what is this delta W equal to? And well, we know from the first law of thermodynamics that, um, that um, the change in internal energy, which is delta U, is equal to the, the work we put in, delta W, plus the heat we put in, delta Q. But the point is that over the course of one entire cycle, well, the engine is in exactly the same state at the end of the cycle as it was at the beginning. So delta U is equal to zero. So the work which we get out, so that will be minus, um, is equal to the heat which we put in. So what we can say is that as we go across one entire cycle, delta W, which is the work we get out, is equal to the sum over the cycle of all the heat we put in, of every dQi, every little bit of heat which we put in over the course of one entire cycle. Now, the next thing which Clausius did is make one very clever little observation as a thought experiment. So Clausius said, let's imagine now that this reservoir, which is at temperature Ti, is connected to a Carnot engine. So he said, let's connect up a Carnot engine like this, and this Carnot engine will be connected to a very large reservoir at temperature T. And this will output some amount of work, DW, at each stage. And it will eject some amount of heat into this reservoir. It will eject DQI into the reservoir at TI. So we have heat going from the main reservoir at T. We don't need to say exactly what that is, but it will be bigger than DQI. And then that is going into the Carnot engine, which is outputting some work and going into and then this heat DQI is going into the reservoir at TI, and that's what's driving this engine over here. So that was the very clever step that um, Clausius said, and now we can look at what we, what we get from that. So what can we say? Well, 
Um, remember earlier we discovered or we stated that for a Carnot engine we have the ratio of the heat over the temperature is equal for the heat in um, and the heat out. They, this ratio is the same. So what we want to say is what is the ratio of the heat into the reservoir Ti, dQi, over Ti. So that is the heat going into this reservoir. And this must be equal to um, this heat over here. Let's just call it dQ, um, dQ over T. Right, so that is an application of this for this Carnot engine here. Um, but furthermore, what we can say is that by the, um, by the conservation of energy, we have that this heat in, dQ, that must be equal to the heat out, dQi, plus the work done, dW. So this is equal to dQi plus dW over T. So that is the first result, and I'm just going to rearrange this now, and I'm going to get dW is equal to dQi brackets T over Ti minus 1. Right, so that is our first result. Um, now, it might look on, on first inspection that this whole contraption here, which we've set up, does nothing but turn heat into work, right? We put in this heat here at the top, and we're getting some work out here and some work out here. And you'll remember from the last video that that is a violation of Kelvin's statement of the second law. And Kelvin's statement says that no process is possible where the sole result is the transfer of heat directly into work with 100% efficiency. So we now need to, um, need to make a statement that, that says that whatever this is, this can't be the case. And the trick is, of course, to remember that Carnot engines are perfectly reversible. So just like over here, we can put work in. And when we put work in, that is a, um, a negative work. If we get work out of the system, then we get a positive work. If we put work into the system, then we represent that as negative work, i.e. we are getting less than positive work out. We have to put work in. So what we're going to say is that um, delta W which is the work we get out of this engine here, plus the sum over one entire cycle of these DWs. And for the avoidance of doubt, I'm going to call that DWI. I'm going to call this DWI. Um, we're going to say that has to be less than or equal to zero. Um, and the only way in which it is equal to zero is if um, we have a perfectly reversible engine. So if, um, if this is a perfectly reversible Carnot engine, then the work we put in, the work we put into the engine is exactly the same as the work we get out at the end. Um, so that is the case where it is equal to zero. And if this engine is not perfectly efficient, um, then this is less than zero. We have to put more work in than we get out. Okay, so this is making sure that Kelvin's statement of the second law is not violated. Right, um, so we are almost done here. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this equation, um, and let me just clear a bit of space. We're going to take that equation, and we're going to use the, um, the equations which we, which we derived earlier. And let me just draw those out again, uh, so we've got them all on the same board. Uh, what we had is that delta W is equal to the sum over a cycle of um, dQi and that um, and that dWi is equal to uh, dQi T over Ti minus 1. So those are the two results we derived earlier. And I'm going to put them into this equation. Um, so let me get down here. <laughs> Putting those into this equation, what we have is the sum over a cycle of dQi um, plus dQi t over ti minus 1 
is less than or equal to zero. And that, um, so we have this dqi here, cancelling with this dqi here, and then this t is a constant, so I can bring that out the front. So we have t, the sum over the cycle of um, dqi over ti is less than or equal to zero, uh, right? So hopefully you can see all of that. Um, and what, let's just clear a bit of space up at the top here. Um, so now I've done this by just doing it in little blobs of dqi, but if we want to make this continuous, then we have to replace this sum with an integral, and we say the integral around a closed cycle, and that's what this, uh, this little circle means, of dqi over ti is less than or equal to zero. Um, and the reason I got rid of this t is because t is, al is always positive. So if this is, equal, is less than or equal to zero, then we can just get rid of that t, and then this concept is less than or equal to zero. Um, so that is Clausius's theorem. Um, and this is a, a really fundamental theorem. It holds equal to zero when we have a Carnot engine, when we have a perfectly reversible engine. If this were a Carnot engine, this would be equal to zero. And in every case where we don't have a Carnot engine, where we have a less than efficient engine, this is less than zero. And as a little spoiler, this dq over t is what will um, come to be defined as the entropy. And we'll see why that's so important and why this is such a fundamental concept in thermal physics in the next video. But there you have it. That's Clausius's theorem. I hope that is, um, that is like a relatively pleasing proof to see. Um, and in the next video, yeah, we'll cover entropy from a, thermo, a thermodynamics, thermal physics point of view in terms of heat and temperature. We'll then come on to talk about entropy in terms of statistical definition. We might even get on to talk about entropy in terms of its probabilistic definition, which some people think is the most fundamental. I'm not so sure. Um, and then we'll look at Maxwell's demon, which is a really fun thought experiment about entropy. So we can really dive into all those topics next. See you then.